And this is your Yeah, your and, I'm, and the thing is that I'm a second speaker, so when I finish, I'll just take it out. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, is it okay for you? I was going to load it on the machine. Ah, no, okay. no, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah? Fine. Okay. Um, so what I was thinking of... To put it on the desktop, this yeah? This is this one. Oh, I don't know. I was just going to try to get it up so I don't fumble around. Uh -huh. and, but I don't want to interfere with... Uh, because you're, you're after me, right? Like, so I'm like second or third? I'm third, yes. Okay, so maybe it could be good for you to, to, to put it on a desktop or... Yeah. Yeah? Okay, so I just can take but it out. Yeah, just try it out. All right. I hope I'm not disrupting your game plan here. Mind if I just paste this under the desktop of this machine? That's very nice. No, that's absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah. Where, where, where is the desktop? <laughs> I can't, I'm not finding it. It's just it. this whole area is actually the desktop. In the middle. It's not pasting. Yeah, yeah. I tried to do it. Hmm. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Let's save it. Is it alright if I save it in the documents folder? Yeah, sure. Okay, and then should so we then go ahead and launch it? Yeah, you can do that and then just minimize it. And you said you have some audio content on there? No. Okay. No. So yeah, to get to that, if you just, yeah, you should just have it open. If you need to, you can always just go to the documents folder. All right, very good. And then we do have the remote, or you can just use the arrows. Very good. So I'm going to pull this one out and yep. hope that nothing... Yeah, it's launching from the document, so it should be good. It should also be in your recent documents. Perfect. Good. Yeah. And this is still active and advancing. All right. We're good. Perfect. Excuse me for that. So you turn the dry light on?
few brave souls. Yeah. They get their money's worth. There were a bunch of talks. There were really like 30 talks at the conference, so they just went to the Yeah, I might just. Somebody else to grab it. Thanks. How you doing? Very well. Alright. How's it going? Yeah, I'm Nathan with an I. Yeah. Nice, nice to meet you too. I'm looking forward to this session and, and learning lots already. Yeah. <laughs> Should we get a, a name card for you? It's pretty tight. I have, I have too much material, but I'll try to streamline and fit in whatever. I mean, I, every time I write, that would be helpful. <laughs> Check yes. it. No, I, I can kick it. Too many Z's. Yeah. Bring the, uh, remember. Bring the gong. Hi, I'm Hans. Good to meet you. <coughs> I was reading the DVD file when you sent me it very intuitive because I think two or three people you put in, I was actually the way for it. Really? If I see the video, I can tell you. About two or three. Yeah. They tend to be. I was hoping for, I usually budget one slide. Mm -hmm. And then, that's what I mean. I okay, so you can reference. I, th I mean, I was all the way over that. I think Dan mm -hmm. Black. I think some of them <laughs> lend itself to that. He's not so. like. <laughs> it's it's against <laughs> me. I know he's been the referee on, on some of our rejections. Yeah, Good morning. Well. I've been a referee on <laughs> a few of those. Um, it's hard to have a conference that goes till 10 o'clock 
<laughs> on Friday night and get everybody back here at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. But um, here we are, and we have an exciting panel. So um, I yesterday I noticed, uh, well, in, in both of the panels um, yesterday afternoon and evening, uh, employment kept coming up. Um, and so employment is key, um, Phyllis Fry said. Um, and and I, I noticed that the people who were most talking about employment actually were the Americans and not the Europeans. So I wanted to say something about that before we um, open up this exciting panel. And I'll just say I'm Karen Engel. Um, I teach here at the law school, um, mostly international human rights, public international law. Um, but I used to teach employment discrimination and even wrote about ENDA in the old days. So that's the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Um, and uh, as Phyllis said last night, um, INDA is back on the table. Um, it passed the Senate um, in the summer, and there's been a big debate if you just Google it, as um, we were told to do a lot last night. Um, you'll see that it's been before the House, um, or it's been being considered in the House, or people are pushing it in the House, but John Boehner is saying that he's not going to allow it to come up for a vote. Um, so it is back on the agenda, and I was just reminded mm -hmm that when ENDA first became, came to be considered seriously was in 1996, um, the same year that the Defense of Marriage Act was passed. And for those of you who might not know this history, I think it's important that ENDA was proposed as an amendment um, to DOMA and in a sort of compromise where it seemed like pro and not so pro, con gay activists said, well, okay, marriage is too far out there to even imagine, but surely we can get a non-discrimination provision um, in employment law. And of course, you know, DOMA passed, um, ENDA did not pass, it failed by one vote in the Senate that year, um, and of course then didn't go to the House, um, and now we have DOMA repeal and we still don't have non-discrimination. Um, and I thought that was important given that we started yesterday with marriage and and a lot of the <laughs> advances, even if people thought they were not advances, um, uh, toward marriage recognition. Um, but I also want to say that to Europeans this might sound a little odd. Um, and, and that's because in the United States our background rule about employment is employment at will. Um, which means that employers can hire, fire, treat you differently for any reason whatsoever except for prohibited reasons. And when I used to teach employment discrimination and I had students from other countries, they all thought that was really odd and it took a while to get down that the background rule was different. So the Europeans weren't talking about employment so much because as a formal rule, there's protection um, because it's for cause um, employment and dismissal, um, which doesn't mean that there's not discrimination it's just that you deal with it in a different matter. So the baseline here is that unless you live in a state um, where employment discrimination is prohibited based on sexual orientation, gender identity, um, or you happen to work for an employer who uh, prohibits discrimination, you don't have that discrimination, that, pr that protection as a general rule in the United States, whereas the opposite would be true in Europe. Um, okay, with that, I'll let the experts um, talk to you. Um, uh, I think, uh, again, we have um, an exciting and diverse panel in terms of backgrounds um, and interests, and it's the most difficult panel, I think, in terms of names that I have to pronounce. Um, so first, I'll just, we'll hear from Hans Yitter, Yitterberg, um, who is a Swedish lawyer, um, has worked in the Swedish government as well as for the European Union and the Council of Europe um, on fundamental rights regarding sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, after he speaks, we'll hear from Krzysztof Smyszek, um, who is a Polish lawyer um, and works on anti-discrimination law in Poland, um, as well as uh, in Europe more broadly through some networks. Um, they're both, I think, going to talk about discrimination a little bit more broadly, not just in employment. In employment. Um, then we'll hear from two economists, um, Nathan Berg and Donald Lian. Um, who, uh, Nathan lives in New Zealand, but I think they're both talking about the U.S. Um, and looking at um, wage disparity between um, GLBT and non-GLBT um, workers. Um, and, and again, mostly in the United States, right? Our work uh, uses U.S. data, but I'm going to give a you know, quick overview of uh, European evidence. Oh, uh, okay. Of which there are quite a, quite a number of studies. Okay. Yeah. Oh, fabulous. Um, <laughs> 
And then uh, finally, we'll hear from Ryan Nelson, who's a US employment lawyer in private practice, um, noticed mostly does defense work, um, and uh, he has written about LGBT rights and employment in the United States. Um, they'll each speak for 25 minutes, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes for um, discussion. So uh, thank you, panelists, for being here. And Hans. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, um, and thank you for having this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I have a background of working in LGBT activism and human rights work for 35 years, um, already long before I went into law, actually. Uh, I have a legal background as an athlete court judge, and also been working internationally, and, and also working for the Swedish parliament and for the, the, the Swedish government, as someone as was mentioned earlier. Um, I've now very recently passed on to totally different matters, but that is, again, even a better reason for, being, for me being grateful for having given this opportunity to sort of relapse into my old profession, professional field, which is, I must admit, where I still have my heart. And I, 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 every time I do get a chance to relapse, I, I certainly try to take it. So thank you for that. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk to you uh, about soft law against discrimination and what's the point. Um, in this case, the soft law in question is a Committee of Ministers recommendation, a Council of Europe Committee of Ministers recommendation to uh, all the 47 member states of the Council of Europe on taking measures against discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. Very briefly, um, uh, recapulating uh, Helmut's introduction uh, yesterday, the Council of Europe is the larger Europe, 47 member states, all geographical Europe minus Belarus, 820 million people, um, whilst the European Union is the smaller Europe, only 28 member states, but with a larger degree of, of legal integration between them. The Council of Europe was founded to focus specifically on human rights while the European Union is focusing on a much broader number of issues. Now the Council of Europe, the, the basic most important legal document is the Convention, European Convention on Human Rights, on which the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg delivers binding judgments, binding on all the 47 member states. Apart from the court, uh, the highest decision-making body of the Council of Europe is the Committee of Ministers, which uh, technically it consists of, of, of the 47 uh, ministers for foreign affairs or state sec secretaries of state, if you want to use the, the US terminology. Now the, the recommendation that I'm talking about is a recommendation that was adopted unanimously by the uh, committee of ministers. They commissioned uh, the recommendation to be drafted by a, a committee of experts uh, representing a smaller group of member states and I had um, the privilege, though I must say not always the pleasure, to chair that committee of, uh, of experts and also to, in, in that capacity of chair, to negotiate the final adoption of the recommendation unanimously by the 47 member states of the Council of Europe. Now the Council of Europe is a very, very mixed group of countries. The 47 member states, they consist of <clears throat> some very progressive countries with a very long-standing history of working very uh, progressively on, on issues of, of sexual orientation and also, at least uh, in later years, uh, in, in, in gender identity issues. But there are, there are also quite a, a few countries who, who might be uh, better correct, characterized as, as authoritarian or even pseudo-democratic uh, with a very, very homophobic and transphobic record. Um, I will not start singling out those, but I, it's difficult to come around the fact that the Russian Federation plays a, a, a very particular role in that group of, of countries. There are others as well. <clears throat> and um, there's also the particularity of the, Council of, oops, of the Council of Europe is that it allows for observatory sta observer status, uh, both to international organizations, which can be very good, uh, like the Amnesty International and the Human Rights Watch, a uh, number of uh, transgender Europe and, and several others. In, in some of them have a general status of, of observers and some have the status of observers for, for specific purposes. But they also allow for the so-called Holy See, which is a 
sort of nicer name for the Vatican, um, to have observer status at the Council of Europe, which means that they take part, they have a right to take part in all the discussions of the Committee of Expert Group as well. So this is, of course, um, was a challenge for the Committee uh, of Experts and for me as a chair to, to, to get work forward. Um, and obviously, if you don't want to end up with a recommendation which is of absolutely no practical value, you cannot just sort of base your work on um, aligning yourself and, and, and looking for partners among the sort of core group of usual suspects who will always support uh, in rights and issues working on, on sexual orientation and gender identity. So you had to look for, for also you know, partners far beyond the, that sort of core group of usual suspects. Now the, the, the recommendation is an important document. I'll come back to, to, to the fact that it's non-legally binding, but it was <clears throat> the first ever uh, intergovernmental human rights instrument dealing specifically with um, sexual orientation and gender identity uh, matters. Now the background of this recommendation was that it was, as I said, it was, it was commissioned by the, com the Committee of Ministers, which in itself was a surprise. Um, I think they, they had no idea what they were getting themselves into. Um, they were probably expecting a very brief sort of paper just uh, writing down or, 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 or recalling very sort of generally formulated fundamental principles of, of human, human rights and, <clears throat> and respect for the human dignity or something like that. Uh, but they, it was the, they drafted it in such a way that it certainly, uh, well, to me, in my mind, it required us to do a much more uh, in-depth work than I think what they had imagined. Uh, and it certainly gave us the possibility and the room to do so space to do so. Now there the are two, the two fundamental starting points for the recommendation. That's one is the terms of reference decided by the Committee of Ministers when they commissioned the, the uh, recommendation. And the, the, the terms of reference mentioned, mentioned that what they wanted was a recommendation on measures. Now measures means something you have to do. It's actions. So you can't, you can't just limit yourself to list, for instance, the human rights references from the Court of Human Rights or and, and UN bodies on human rights. That wouldn't be measures. If they wanted measures, so that, that implies actions that have a practical purpose. And the measures were supposed to aim at three things, to combat sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination, to ensure the respect for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and, and transgender persons, human rights, and thirdly, to promote tolerance towards them. Now, I very much dislike the word tolerance, but um, sometimes you just have to, you know, bite it and <laughs> shut up and keep on working. So in this case, it was good. Um, the other fundamental starting point was that it was founded in historic and present reality. The committee ministers in their commission themselves wrote that discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation and gender, or gender identity, as well as homophobia and intolerance towards transgender persons, are regrettably still widespread in Europe. So they identified a practical problem as well. Now, the historic and present reality was, again, emphasized uh, in saying that they stated that discrimination grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity, as well as homophobia, uh, uh, is something that is, is, um, has been going on for centuries and that it still affects uh, uh, LGBT people even within their own families. So that was also sort of a Surprise to me, surprisingly radical statement of, of, of fact. Now, the recommendation stand, stands on two legs, basically. First of all, it's been drafted and very consciously drafted as a conservative document. Uh, there were a number of member states that didn't like the fact that I kept <coughs> calling this a conservative document. But it is, in the sense that uh, it, it adheres very closely to fundamental human rights principles and standards, primarily the European Convention on Human Rights, and the European Court of Human Rights' case law. So not inventing a lot of new things, avoiding sort of all wishful thinking. Um, we didn't start by, for instance, putting marriage up there, saying, okay, all member states should now legislate to allow for same-sex marriage. <clears throat> um, so the, the few principles then that were very important. First of all, um, it's the responsibility of member states to see to that the European Convention 
is actually being implemented. It's not the responsibility of the court or anybody else. It's the responsibility of the member states. But at the same time, the member states have, in the European Convention itself, they have deferred the meaning of what, um, what human rights and what obligations under the conventions are to the court. Article 46 of the European Convention says that, that sorry, the Article 32 says that the interpretation and the application of the convention lies with the court. And in Article 46, it says that it imposes on the state a legal obligation to implement general or individual measures to secure the right which the court has found to be violated, also with respect to other persons in the same situation, notably by solving the problems that have led to the court's finding a violation of the convention. So it's not only the result of a judgment or ruling, it's not only that, well, you have to um, do right what was done wrong to this individual and compensate that person. You also have a responsibility to see to that the situation in your country changes so that other people in the same situation do not suffer the same violation. Um, also, uh, the recommendation is decided very consciously to draw on other already um, existing texts, apart from the, the convention itself texts adopted by the Committee of Ministers in other sort of related or, or nearby human rights field, um, like for instance on, on racism or women's rights and so on and so forth. <clears throat> uh, not, not least in the area of, of hate speech and intolerance, hate, hate crimes and so on and so forth, there are quite a, a few references that were very useful from nearby areas that we could use and then just transpose that into uh, the field of sexual orientation and gender identity. And we also drew on, 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 on the European Social Charter, the European Convention on the Rights of the Child, the first protocol to the European Convention, which deals, f with, among other things, with the right to education, for instance. Um, now, these other instruments are, of course, only legally binding on the states that have ratified them. But the European Court of Human Rights itself uh, repeatedly has said that it, it, it pays uh, particular attention also to these other uh, nearby similar international instruments for human rights. So since the court does that, of course, it was possible to, for us to do it uh, when, when drafting the recommendation. And of course, it focuses primarily on well-known problem areas. Again, going back to the committee minister's uh, 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 terms of reference, saying that you know, the recommendation must have a practical purpose. So, um, <clears throat> A couple of, 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 of more fundamental principles more specific to, to the content of, the, uh, of this recommendation was that sexual orientation was already a prohibited ground for discrimination under the European Convention, Article 14. Uh, at this point in time, gender identity was also, if not more than implicitly, but still a protected uh, ground for discrimination under the Convention. Sexual orientation was already a suspect discrimination ground. Uh, using U.S. terminology, um, i.e. requiring strict scrutiny for any difference in treatment not to be considered illegal. Gender identity, the same way, at this point in time, implicitly also a suspect ground. The 1993 UN Vienna Human Rights Declaration and Program of Action, which was unanimously adopted by the UN uh, member states, uh, stated that while the significance of national and regional, regional particularities and various historical, cultural, and religious backgrounds must be borne in mind. It is the duty of states, regardless of their political, economic, or cultural systems, to promote and protect all human rights and fundamental freedoms. And then, again, coming back to one of the issues I think Helmut mentioned yesterday, uh, the European Court of Human Rights is. Uh, case law in the so-called British military cases, where the court made it clear that a negative, negative attitudes on the part of a heterosexual majority against uh, a homosexual minority cannot amount to sufficient justification any more than similar attitudes towards those of a different race, origin, or color. So that was also a fundamental principle for, for guiding the, the drafting hands of, of the recommendation. And finally, Article 17 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which prohibits the abuse of conventional rights, 
to deprive others of their rights. So for instance, freedom of religion or freedom of expression cannot serve as a sort of blanket excuse for sexual orientation or gender identity discrimination or hate speech or hate crimes uh, or for not taking measures against hate speech or hate crimes uh, on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. Now leaving all those principles, just giving you a very brief overview of what the uh, recommendation actually contains. The recommendation, of course, can be found on the internet. Uh, and the recommendation is accompanied by an explanatory memorandum, which goes more into to detail, sort of giving the reasons for each uh, paragraph of the actual recommendation. Now, the recommendation, well, it contains a, a preamble give it, stating some, some of the background reasons. It contains the recommendation proper, uh, which is five paragraphs. Uh, on legislation and, 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 and uh, ensuring that victims of discrimination are aware of their rights and that they have effective remedies and so on and so forth. Ending with the last paragraph saying that member states are in, shall, shall ensure by appropriate means, uh, appropriate means and action that this recommendation, including its appendix, is translated and disseminated as wide as possible and that they will be guided in their legislation, policies and practices by the principles and measures contained in the appendix. So the appendix actually contains the actual substan substance of the recommendation. And the appendix deals with right to life, security and protection from violence, specifically deals with hate crimes and other hate motivated incidents. It deals with hate speech. It deals with the freedom of uh, association, peaceful association, peaceful assembly, uh, freedom of expression. It deals with respect for private and family life. It deals with health care, it deals with education, um, it deals with employment, it deals with housing, and it also deals with issues like sports, um, and it deals with uh, the right to seek asylum, uh, deals with national human rights structures and their mandate to, to uh, work on these issues, and it deals very briefly with discrimination on multiple grounds as well. So it's, 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 it's quite a comprehensive sort of substantial scope that the recommendation has. Um, I'm certainly not going to uh, go through the whole recommendation. There's no time for that. I will, however, just high, try to highlight a few of the, the issues that, that we deal with. Um, when it comes to hate crimes, for instance, <clears throat> member states are um, told that they should um, ensure that when determining sentences or sanctions, a bias motive for a, a violent crime, for instance, if the a bias motive related to sexual orientation or gender identity, it must be, legislation must allow, must allow for that to be taken into account as an aggravating circumstance. Now this was before the, the court came down with its ruling in X versus Turkey, where it actually says that right out. Uh, but it has said that before on issues of of racist crime, for instance. So um, the court in Angelo and Ilya versus Bulgaria uh, said that failing to take into account that the motive, bias motive has played a role in treating racially induced violence and brutality on an equal footing with cases that have no racist overtones would be to turn a blind eye to the specific nature of acts that are particularly destructive of fundamental rights. And that would actually amount to what under the European Convention is called indirect discrimination under Article 14. That would be, I guess, disparate, disparate impact, I think, under US terminology. Um, the recommendation also says that member states should ensure the safety and dignity of all persons in prison and in other ways deprived of their liberty because they are particularly vulnerable because they're locked up with other people uh, that may actually submit them to, to, to violent treatment. Measures should be taken so as to adequately protect and respect the gender identity of transgender persons who find themselves in these circumstances. And again, in the explanatory memorandum, we do come back to that issue, just highlighting once again that where transgender persons are concerned, the authorities should be particularly careful with the choice of prison, male or female, so as to adequately protect and respect the gender identity of the individual to be imprisoned. Now moving on to another area, dealing with freedom of association. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, we noted in, in the, the uh, recommendation that discriminatory, discriminatory administrative procedures, including excessive formalities for the registration and pra practical functioning of associations, uh, should be prevented and removed. It's very common in many countries, um, not least in the former um, Soviet Union republics and some areas of, of, of Eastern Europe that um, administrative formalities of that kind are, are being used to stop uh, LGBT organizations from, from, from being able to function. So may, and measures should also be taken to prevent the abuse of legal and administrative provision, provisions such as those that are related to restrictions based on public health, public morality, and public order. I mean, those, those, those um, parameters are, generally speaking, in, in human rights law, are legitimate grounds for limiting the use of, of, of your freedoms to, to assemble or, or freedom of expression. But they can also very easily be abused. I mean, what is the defin def definition of public morality, public order, et cetera, et cetera. So we are very clear stating here that, that member states should take action so as to, to prevent uh, those grounds from being abused, uh, both when it comes to freedom of association, when it comes to freedom of expression, and freedom and, and peaceful uh, assembly. Turning to respect for private and family life, which is a very broad concept, it, it deals with, with uh, uh, both uh, family law and, uh, and uh, employment. We are dealing with uh, all of those, uh, well, employment is specific, uh, but it, it, it deals with family life uh, and a few uh, other things. Uh, so what we're saying here, for instance, is that member, sh member states should uh, um, ensure that personal data referring to a person's sexual orientation and gender identity are not collected, otherwise used by public institutions, including in particular with, in the law enforcement um, structures. And this is, of course, before Helmut's very recent case against Austria, where the court actually said that it was a violation of human rights to keep old records of convictions under uh, discriminatory criminal law in Austria, to still keep those records on the books. Um, member states are, should take all appropriate measures to guarantee the full legal recognition of a person's gender reassignments in all er areas of life. Um, the right to trans of gen transgender persons to marry the persons of the sex opposite to their reassigned sex is effectively guaranteed. Um, I just want to mention that all the whole issue of terminology around transsexuality, transgender persons, transsexualism, uh, re gender reassignment was a very highly contentional, uh, it was, it was the, f the focus of a lot of the conflicts between member states. So these are the, the terminology that we ended up using because they, we could get a consensus from the member states, foreign ministers around them, not because we actually find them ideal in any ways. <clears throat> uh, where national legislation does not recognize nor confer rights or obligations on registered same-sex partnerships and unmarried couples, member states are invited to consider the possibility of providing same-sex couples with legal or other measures, other means to address the practical problems related to the social reality in which they live. I will leave that area and just mention education and employment very briefly. Member states were told to ensure the establishment and implementation of appropriate measures which provide effect, effective protection against discrimination in the employment area, also in the private sector. And these measures should cover conditions for access to employment and promotion, dismissals, pay and other working conditions, including the, the prevention, combating and punishment of harassment and other forms of victimization. We particularly singled out, singled out in the explanatory memorandum the uh, vulnerable situation within the armed forces. Uh, we also um, specifically in the recommendation itself uh, mentioned the issue of that particular attention by the member states should be paid to avoid any irrelevant disclosure of the gender history of uh, transgender persons uh, or their former name to the employer and other employees. Education, the, we pointed specifically to the obligation of member states to ensure that uh, LGBT children have access to education in a safe environment, safe from, from bullying and so on and so forth, and that they should have access to curricula and uh, teaching materials which are uh, respectful and, and that 
uh, are in line with the general principles of uh, human dignity and human rights. Um, I will leave the contents of the actual recommendation on that note and just briefly um, wrap up by mentioning what I see is the possible impact of the recommendation. What was the point? I mean, it is not legally binding, as I started out saying. Now, that was actually a necessary prerequisite for it being adopted, I think. It would not have been possible to get a, recommendation, uh, to get a, a protocol to the convention or a new convention uh, passed by the 47 member states. That would not have been uh, desirable either, in my opinion because the very clear message such a protocol would have sent is that, well, to protect the human rights of LGBT persons, <clears throat> you have to draft a separate document. Thus, the existing convention and other uh, instruments for the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms do not apply to LGBT persons. So that would be a very, very dangerous path to go down. So it was a prerequisite, but I think it was also a good idea, so to speak. Um, the will, it, what, it, what it opened up for was the willingness of the member states to accept that all of us, all the 47 member states, have work to do in this area, more or less. But none of us are, you know, can sit back and say, okay, we're, we're done. You know, we all have a work to do. So it was not a question of, of pointing fingers and apportioning blame and so on. Now, what it also did, even though it's legally not binding, it placed sexual orientation and gender identity intolerance and discrimination right in the heart or at the heart of the human rights discourse. I mean, that could be, and there can be no doubt that if there ever were, that LGBT human rights issues are an issue of fundamental human rights, of the same fundamental human rights. Now, governments have now taken upon themselves, no one else has obliged them, the governments have taken upon themselves by unanimously adopting this recommendation to act. Now that gives leverage, in my opinion, and legitimacy for state actors within the member states to act, like for instance ombudsman's offices or, or government agencies of different kinds, the courts, uh, schools, local government uh, boards, and so on and so forth. It gives le leverage and legitimacy for political bodies to act i.e. members of, of parliament of the different member states, me members of local decision-making bodies, uh, members of the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe, now have a legitimate ground to stand on for them to, 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 to take this further. And not least, it gives leverage and legitimacy and tools to work with for NGOs, non-governmental organizations, activist groups, uh, on a national and international level to act and monitor the actions or omissions to act by state actors within the scope of this recommendation. And to conclude, the court, and this is, was actually one of the things that the, the Vatican and the Russian Federation and a couple of other strong opponents to this repeatedly pointed to was going to happen, the court has already started, the Court of Human Rights has started to quote it as relevant Council of Europe material. So thereby, it uses it as a basis for interpreting the convention. And that will eventually, if you would accept the term through the back door, it will acquire sort of a legally binding uh, um, uh, nature anyway. Just three, four examples of that. I'm not going to go into the cases, just mention them. Um, X and others versus Austria, dealing with second parent adoption. Alexeyev versus Russian Federation, freedom of expression, peaceful assembly. Vedeland and others versus Sweden, um, freedom of expression versus hate speech. And now the last one, Balianatos and others versus Greece, regarding the obligations to, to um, allow a registered partnership with civil union legislation. If you have one, it has to already also apply in a non-discriminatory fashion to same-sex couples. In the three first of these cases, the court simply mentioned the recommendation under the title relevant uh, Council of Europe legal uh, material. In the fourth one, the last one, it took, in Valianatos, it took one step further. It actually said in one line that it obs the court no took notice of the fact that there is a clear trend 
in relevant Council of Europe materials to treat same-sex and opposite-sex couples equally. And in that regard, the court refers particularly to the committee minister's recommendation and then found a violation uh, of the convention. So that's the point of soft law <laughs> against discrimination. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a big pleasure and uh, honor to be here and to present some information on Polish situation towards LGBT uh, people. Um, I'm representing Poland, which, al which is also a European country. But, uh, you know, comp Europe is not a, I would say, uh, th uh, there's no same level of protection for LGBT people uh, in Europe. I mean, there are countries like the Netherlands or Sweden or the UK, and also there are countries like Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, or even Russian Federation when the lives of uh, LGBT people uh, are not so um, nice. So um, uh, I, I will focus only on three things. Uh, first, that will be an employ employment sphere and uh, short history of, of uh, uh, anti-discrimination legislation uh, um, in Poland. Uh, I will focus shortly on uh, hate crimes and hate speech legislation, as well as uh, I will try to provide some information on worrying trends um, in Eastern countries towards so-called um, homosexual propaganda um, issues, I mean the, the legis legislations that prohibit so-called pro uh, homosexual propaganda. So um, uh, in a nutshell, the short history of LGBT tolerance in Poland. So actually in uh, Poland have, has a quite a long history of uh, um, non-discrimination, I would say, uh, of LGBT pe people because uh, uh, in 1932 uh, there was a the, uh, the, the penalization of homosexual intercourses. So uh, more than, I would say, now eight years of, of uh, abolishing of so-called sodomy laws in, in, in my country. Then we had a, a communist era, uh, 45, 89. So no sodomy laws were uh, introduced, but uh, kind of hypocrisy and silence uh, in so-called uh, sexual sphere. I mean, communists, they did not deal in sexual orientation or sexuality, sexuality at all. Even the principle of equality uh, is at heart of communism. Uh, so uh, uh, they did not um, use this principle toward, uh, towards LGBT people. And uh, 85, 87, uh, the com there was a, um, quite a famous action called Hyacinth Action against gay men accused of um, spreading AIDS. Uh, so that was an action um, conducted by uh, communist secret service. Uh, so um, after the communism collapsed uh, in uh, 89, 97, we, have a new con we had a new constitution adopted and there was a huge debate on uh, anti-discrimination clause uh, of, the cons of the new constitution. Uh, some um, um, politicians, they wanted to have a very detailed list of uh, grants of um, uh, discrimination uh, included into the equality clause, uh, but because of the huge influence of the Catholic Church, uh, the uh, lawmakers, they decided to um, adopt just a general clause of, uh, concerning equality. So we don't have any um, uh, we didn't have any um, sexual orientation or gender identity words included, uh, and we don't, still don't have uh, into the um, Constitution. 
But, uh, and the situation changed uh, as of 1st of May 2004 when Poland joined uh, the European Union. And I would say that a new era for legal recognition of sexual orientation uh, came since Poland was forced by the European Union to change its law. Uh, and um, uh, according to, to what the European Union law says about discrimination on the ground of, of sexual orientation, Poland had to uh, change its uh, employment um, legislation uh, and uh, include uh, the this diabolic words of sexual orientation and gender, uh, sorry, just sexual orientation into the labor code. So, uh, so now uh, the labor uh, law prohibits uh, discrimination on the ground of sexual orientation in terms of when establishing an employment relationship, when concluding the employment, as well as uh, um, all employment conditions, including equal pay. So uh, I would say that the employment sphere is quite mm -hmm. well covered by anti-discriminatory provisions and LGBT people are quite well protected. And this is the only sphere in Polish uh, legislation that contain, uh, that uh, uh, includes um, explicit uh, pr um, ban on uh, sexual orientation uh, discrimination. The gender identity and gender expression are not um, uh, directly like, covered by anti-discrimination legislation, but according to the um, judgments of the European Union Court, uh, the gender identity is, uh, uh, is a grant protected um, on the ground of gender in general. So, uh, uh, but there is a, uh, quite a, um, I would say, hot debate now in Poland if the gender expression grant or gender identity should be explicitly mentioned in the labor code and other uh, anti-discriminatory provisions or not. So when it uh, comes to the employment uh, discrimination, so um, the personal scope of the prohibition of sexual orientation discrimination is actually quite broad. Uh, and we can uh, say that there are that three groups of, of employees that are protected, against, uh, protected um, against discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation. So these are, these are persons uh, discriminated, discriminated against um, uh, um, against their actual sexual orientation, so LGBT people, but also heterosexual people, are protected against discrimination. Uh, we also have some cases on discrimination based on heterosexual orientation. Uh, there, there was a case of a person who applied for a job at a, as a, um, a bartender uh, at a gay club, and the gay club said, no, you're straight, so you're, uh, you're, you're denied. So um, that's, that's pure discrimination based on sexual orientation. So um, this is not only designed for, for LGBT people, it's, all this, it's, it's designed uh, um, for all, all uh, employees. But also uh, the uh, anti-discrimination legislation protects um, uh, people against uh, discrimination on their assumed sexual orientation. And we had one case in Poland concerning uh, uh, a teacher, a female teacher, and it was a kind of weird situation when after just right there, she just cut her hair very shortly. Um, she was um, called by the, uh, how do you call it, the, the, the school principal. Uh, uh, and, and the school principal said that, uh, you know, you look like a lesbian and I don't want to have lesbian teachers in my school, so please don't do it in future, uh, the, the hairdo. So actually the, the woman was, uh, was straight, but she was perceived as being lesbian. So, uh, uh, so this kind of actions are also, um, are, are also um, uh, let's say, uh, covered by anti-discrimination legislation in employment. And also there is a third group of people who are not gay or lesbians or, or transgender, uh, but are still uh, protected by the anti-discrimination legislation. This is called, uh, this situation is called um, discrimination by association. And actually we had one very famous case in Poland during, uh, I mean, that was 2006, 
when the, uh, the po Pol when Poland was uh, ruled by extremists, uh, right extremists, and the minister, mm, uh, there was a case of a director uh, of a um, center for training, uh, national center for uh, training for teachers. And um, the, the center is supervised by the Minister of Education. And um, the, the, di director, the, the director of the, the chief of the, of the center was fired, was kicked out uh, from his job because uh, uh, the center published a manual for teachers on how to teach uh, students uh, about human rights. And that was, that was a, quite a huge book consisting of 600 pages. Only one page was devoted to LGBT. Uh, discrimination and because of this one page, uh, the director, the chief of the center, was um, immediately fired by the uh, uh, by the minister, and the the, the, the director went to the uh, I mean lodged his complaint to the labor court, and the court said that that was a discrimination based on political views on human rights, which was not very um, uh, I would say satisfactory. Uh, I, I mean. Uh, my organization was not very satisfied with this with this ruling, and we joined the uh, the procedure and we tried to um, convince the court that the real uh, reason for uh, kicking this guy out was uh, uh, was a sexual orientation um, uh, issue, uh, and we tried to convince the court that he was uh, he was fired because of the sexual orientation. Uh, uh, let's say phenomenon, uh, not not his sexual orientation, but the uh, sexual ori orientation as a theme uh, within the within the book. I mean, the court did not accept our <laughs> our arguments, but we are still convinced that this was just because of the of the sexual orientation issue, uh, not on his political views, but uh, the sexual orientation uh, issue. So um, Poland. Uh, Adopted um, uh, new provisions on uh, on um, uh, prohibition of sexual orientation discrimination, uh, and now we uh, the, the labor legislation contains few key key definitions of um, uh, of, of discrimination. So one of them is direct discrimination, and direct the, the definition of direct discrimination is. Um, as uh, like following, uh, direct discrimination shall be taken to occur where one person is treated less favorably than other, another is, has been or would be treated in a comparable situation on the ground of sexual orientation. That's the definition of the direct discrimination and uh, the examples of direct discrimination and, and then, uh, cases of direct discrimination that I, I'm dealing with um, in Poland as, uh, as, um, are like following, like for example, asking uh, about candidates' sexual orientation during the jo job interviews, or um, restricting employment benefits only for married or unmarried different sex uh, uh, partners only, or uh, wrongful termination of empl employment contracts. That, that these are the most, I would say, um, uh, most uh, frequent examples of um, direct discrimination based on sexual orientation. Uh, yeah, another interesting concept of discrimination is indirect discrimination, uh, which shall be taken to occur when apparently neutral provision, criterion, or practice would put persons having a particular sexual orientation at a particular disadvantage compared with other persons, unless that provision, criterion, or practice is objectively justified by a legitimate aim, and the means of achieving that aim are appropriate and necessary. So, um, what we observe that the, uh, in, in direct discrimination takes place mostly in the situation when the, uh, because of the assumption uh, of the employer that all workers are heterosexual, and so the workplace culture does not take into account uh, the needs uh, of, uh, of people of another sexual orientation. So um, uh, the most common example, uh, examples of uh, indirect discrimination uh, are like, for example, the formulating the job advertisements, um, saying that they are only restricted only to married candidates or to the candidates that conduct stable lives. I mean, stable life 
in Poland mean that, uh, means that uh, you're married, you've got children, so you'll be devoted to your work, uh, so because you, you've got family to, to feed, so, uh, uh, so you will be keeping this job uh, uh, for, for a se I mean, treating this job seriously, and you will not uh, leave this job immediately. Or, for example, the leave arrangements uh, for, uh, for um, uh, workers or social benefits for marriages only. So, because in Poland, you do not have any kind of, um, we don't have any kind of registered partnership legislation or, or uh, same-sex marriage legis legislation. So, to my mind, uh, no one can fulfill the obligation uh, or the requirement of being married to get uh, additional social benefit for um, uh, benefit from the employer. So that's the uh, uh, very, I would say, um, uh, essence of the indirect um, discrimination. Also, there is a, a definition of instruction to discriminate. This is also the prohibited uh, action, um, discriminatory action. Uh, it is uh, discriminatory to issue and instructions to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. This would apply, for example, in the cases of an employer issuing uh, instructions to a recruitment agency that they want to have only like normal people or uh, uh, straight people in their uh, workplace. And uh, uh, the anti-discrimination legislation in Poland contains also some uh, exceptions. Uh, from the um, equality, I mean, non-discrimination uh, uh, clauses. So, for example, one of them is genuine occupational requirements, uh, which says that a, jo a job may be restricted to people of certain sexual orientation if this is a genuine and determining occupational requirement, provided that the objective is legitimate and the requirement is proportionate. So, I mean, it's Quite, quite hard to imagine a job which uh, fits only to, to, let's say, gays and les or lesbians. Uh, but there was a Swedish case, mm, so uh, Hans was dealing with this case as an ombudsman, I remember, that was a, a job restricted only for uh, LGBT, for, for not only for, to gay people uh, in terms of, uh, and the job was offered by the, uh, I think, AIDS uh, counseling. Oh, the yeah, the, the National LGBT Organization, and the, the, the job uh, was, um, I mean, the, the essence of the job was uh, that this person would, uh, would be, was to be a counsel, counselor, uh, advisor to, to, to men having sex with, another, with other men. Uh, so that was a, a, a genuine occupational requirement to be a, a gay person. But in, uh, in reality, I, I just can't imagine uh, many uh, uh, work positions Mm, or job positions uh, restricted only to specific sexual orientation um, or to, to the employees with a specific sexual orientation. And actually, uh, there was a huge debate um, uh, in Poland uh, a few years ago uh, when the Minister for Equality, she said that she, when the anti-discrimination legislation was uh, introduced, she said uh, in, the, in the interview, TV interview that she cannot imagine that the Catholic school uh, is forced to employ a lesbian teacher. Uh, I mean, she said that the anti-discrimination legislation does not apply to these situations because um, one of the uh, exceptions um, uh, within the anti-discrimination law in Poland, employment law in Poland, is that uh, the church organizations uh, are allowed to discriminate uh, when employing people uh, but only on the ground of their religion. So, for example, the, the Catholic, uh, let's say, NGO or Catholic parish uh, is allowed to uh, not to employ, uh, let's say, the mes Muslim uh, uh, um, candidates, uh, but it cannot, this exception cannot be treated as allowing those or these organizations not to employ people uh, because of other grounds. So, for example, the Catholic parish or Catholic um, school is not allowed to, um, uh, not to employ a lesbian teacher because le uh, so homosexuality uh, is not a religion. The, the religion is, you know, being Catholic or Muslim, but not homosexual. So this exception is, uh, should be treated very na uh, narrowly and, uh, and is restricted only to the ground 
of uh, religion of our uh, belief. So, uh, and uh, harassment, that's also a, a, a definition, I mean, that's also a concept of discrimination, and harassment shall be deemed to be a form of discrimination when unwanted conduct related to sexual orientation takes place with the purpose of or effect of violating the dignity of a person and of a creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, um, or offensive environment. And actually, um, taking into account, if, I mean, huge uh, homophobia and uh, uh, in Poland, I mean, harassment is one of the most common, um, uh, let's say, um, I mean, it's, it's most common, uh, harassment on the ground of, of sexual orientation is most, it's most common um, uh, within the cases uh, concerning discrimination based on sexual orientation. So uh, uh, last year we we won a case of uh, uh, of discrimination of of, of, a, of uh, we won a harassment case of a guy who was extremely uh, discriminated and harassed because of his sexual orientation, uh, and the case was widely covered by media. So uh, there was a kind of educational dimension of this of this case too. Um, so, um, when I say legal coming out, so uh, does it work in Poland, I would definitely say it does, uh, uh, and for, for several reasons. When I say legal coming out, I say when, uh, uh, this is the situation when the lawmakers decide to put explicitly words of sexual orientation, gender identity into the texts of the, uh, of the law. Uh, so, it gives you, I mean, it gives a, a lot of results. First of all, we noticed that uh, the law, which is now uh, has been binding for the last 10 years, um, resulted in raising awareness among LGBT employees on their rights. That's why we have more and more, more cases on, on employment discrimination on the basis of uh, sexual orientation. But all, uh, just like I said, that, yeah, we, we've got more and more uh, cases on this, and the labor courts uh, are facing more, um, uh, more uh, lawsuits on this, um, uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, also, we are getting more and more, uh, I mean, higher and higher amounts of compensations for uh, victims of discrimination. Why? Because the judges are like forced to deal with these cases. I mean, for them, uh, it's still something new to, to, to have a um, homosexual or transgender uh, uh, complainant in the courtroom. So uh, the very uh, uh, first years of the anti-discrimination legislation, the compensations were extremely low and actually they were just symbolic, uh, 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 so to say. But now we've got more and more, I mean the, the, the amounts are higher and higher and of course we cannot compare to the American uh, situation when you're winning like millions of dollars. We are still uh, winning like, you know, thousands of, of, of euros, which is, uh, for Poland, quite a big amount, uh, still quite a big uh, amount of money. Um, and few words about hate crimes um, legislation in Poland. Uh, so just to let you know that uh, last year, we, I mean, the, the, the biggest Polish organiz LGBT organization conducted a survey. Uh, they asked 11,000 people uh, on um, their perception of discrimination, uh, and the survey showed that almost 12% uh, of, of surveyed uh, people, mm, uh, they said that they were victims of physical violence and almost half, uh, 50 uh, were uh, victims of psychological violence. Uh, but still, I mean, th uh, even the, the homophobic uh, attacks and, and, and violence is very visible. Uh, Polish hate crime legislation does not protect, does not uh, include uh, sexual orientation or gender identity grounds. Uh, the uh, anti-hate crime uh, provisions concern only race, nationality, ethnic origin, or religion. And this is really a, a problem since uh, uh, lack of recognition results in low level of reporting of these cases. Then LGBT people uh, or victims treat homophobic or transphobic violence as a natural experience in their life. I mean, the, the people say that, okay, I'm living in Poland, I'm gay, so the, the uh, aggression and, and the physical violence is a natural part of my life and I have to live with this. So they don't fight with this, they just agree for this kind of uh, treatment. But lack of uh, recognition uh, also results in lack of statistics 
And this makes it uh, very difficult to estimate the real level of homophobic and transphobic crimes because the, 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 the crimes are treated as a normal, uh, a normal uh, uh, let's say, normal crimes. And also, the lack of statistics is treated by the government as an evidence that the crimes against LGBT people is marginal. So this is kind of vicious circle in Poland. You don't have statistics because you don't have law, and you don't have law because you don't have statistics, uh, convincing st statistics that the law is needed. So this is uh, a kind of situation that we have to uh, deal with. And I was also asked to provide some information on Eastern countries. So uh, um, uh, I'm not a specialist in, in Eastern countries, but uh, European countries, but uh, there is a uh, horrifying, worrying trend in countries like uh, Russian Federation, like Moldova, Ukraine, Lithuania, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that the countries um, uh, I mentioned they, uh, they introduce or they're trying to introduce a specific legislation uh, which are uh, usually called um, legislation in order to protect minors uh, and religious beliefs from the uh, aggressive and unnatural, um, um, let's say, um, uh, information. Uh, and uh, at the first glance, the uh, the laws are, I would say, quite okay. I mean, everybody wants to protect children from unwanted uh, uh, information, but in real, the legislation uh, uh, is absolutely designed to combat any form of manifestation of uh, someone's, of, of someone's uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. And uh, even, uh, I mean, uh, manifestations like uh, uh, waving the rainbow flag or uh, screening the publicly the LGBT uh, movie is treated as an attacked attack on the public order. So uh, some countries are still working on on, on this law, and even um, I mean Russian Federation that they, uh, they passed this law. Ukraine is working on this. Lithuania, even Lithuania belongs to the European Union. Uh, uh, it uh, they still have this anti-homosexual. Um, uh, legislation. So, um, okay, so I may, maybe I will finish here and uh, I mean, I'm open to, uh, to questions uh, uh, concerning Polish situation, but also Central Eastern Europe. Thank you very much. Hello, and thanks to Tom for assembling all of us. This has been a terrific instance for thinking about the feedback that was just mentioned between getting the empirical descriptive statistics of uh, which outcomes in terms of discrimination and uh, labor market events really matter, and then the legislation that is motivated by those facts and this kind of vicious circle, chicken and egg question is uh, at the heart of motivation for people like my co-author, Don Lien, and I to in probe the measurement issues, and there are many of them. Uh, the short summary is that there's clear evidence uh, across many countries of a discriminatory wage uh, depression for gay males and uh, estimates on lesbian wage effects are, have been reported as both positive premium and uh, negative penalties. And I just want to review the evidence. The background for this is, of course, uh, given very ably by Karen's introduction that the default law, when our first paper was published in 2002, uh, only one state out of out of 50 had any uh, anti-discrimination policy in the, the labor code in something like uh, 130 cities. Right now we've got just about half of the U.S. states have something, uh, basically a language drawn from Civil Rights Act 1964 that simply adds sexual orientation as one of the prohibited criteria to, uh, that employers can use. So I want to uh, blast through a, a wide survey of evidence both in the US and Europe and talk about some of the measurement problems uh, with any active scientific 
investigation. Uh, there are lots of uh, technical issues under the hood, and uh, everyone in this room will clearly see uh, problems for, that social scientists run into when they start thinking about the right taxonomies to use uh, for studying sexual orientation minorities, and also the right um, measures of labor market outcomes and ways we might actually observe discrimination in a way that would motivate uh, uh, legislative agendas, whether they be rights agendas or, or more narrowly targeted uh, labor discrimination protection provisions. And then the last thing I want to contribute is, is how uh, my own thinking as a strong supporter of ENDA back in 2002 when we began studying this issue has evolved and uh, I will talk about moving from the descriptive statistics of labor discrimination to a, a, a philosophy of, of how legislative institutions might be drafted and whether the one size fits all, the universal codification of rights is in fact the way we want to go. Uh, even after we share, uh, we might agree on an axiomatic uh, goal but have different ideas about the right institutional approaches to advance toward that goal. Okay, uh, definitions of sexual orientation that appear in the economics and policy empirical studies trying to uh, measure wage effects. Uh, the very first paper in 1995 by Lee Badgett used behavioral definition which simply surveyed people, the general social survey, uh, asking people about the gender and number of sexual partners in the last year, in the last five years, since you were 18. And uh, I'm going to refer to those uh, sexual behavior-based definitions as behavioral. Uh, another way to measure sexual orientation is to ask people, how do you identify? And there's a surprisingly weak correlation between the two in some important instances that I'll try to mention. Uh, back to, if you read the Kinsey study, there, there are ideas of a continuum of sexual identities that shows up in this literature in some places. And then one of the oddest things, more than half of the published papers in economics documenting uh, discriminatory wage effects based on sexual orientation are actually based on data sets that have no information at all about sexual orientation that simply look for an unrelated adult same-sex cohabitation as a proxy for a same-sex sexual identity. And uh, you can see what a, uh, what a terribly weak uh, measurement approach that is. And uh, so in moving from evidence to arguments about uh, policy approaches to uh, protect uh, sexual citizenship or identity rights, uh, then I just wanted to bring to bear some of the weaknesses in the parts of the empirical literature just so uh, when, uh, when we discuss what is the evidential grounds for moving on, on anti-discrimination legislation, for example, that we're, we're clear that there's been a, a wide variety of measurement approaches, some of them uh, with more problems than others. Okay, so Lee Badgett, 1995, of finds gay men have a statistically significant and uh, economically important uh, wage gap below similarly uh, productive straight men. And productive, this is the, the statistical challenge, is looking for all the, the legitimate reasons for that uh, employers might pay workers for their, their characteristics based on, on workplace productivity. And then if you can't explain people the, the different wages you observe based on the number of hours worked, the amount of education, the industry you work in, uh, the, the region of the country, we throw in all the possible uh, statistical controls we can get in it, then if you still see there's a big gap between uh, the individual workers we've coded as sexual orientation minorities and a person, this is a thought experiment, not a direct observation, a person with exactly the same productivity characteristic profile, but differs only by sexual orientation. And this is the thought experiment we're, we're entertaining. Uh, so there is, in addition to these behavioral definitions, of Laumann and colleagues of, in a very interesting, a more anthropological interview-based study uh, also asked, asked about both behavior and identity and found 
extremely weak correlations with the kinds of uh, measures that show up in this literature. Uh, if you ask people about the number and gender of sex partners since they were 18, uh, and then ask uh, how do you self-describe or self-identify, uh, you can get very different ideas of what the right taxonomy of sexual orientation should be for, for trying to measure anti-discrimination and uh, surprisingly a weak correlations. In, uh, in Lee Badgett's study, for example, more than 40% of, of the, the gay men in, in her data set are, are also married and they got coded as gay because they had a same-sex sexual partner since the age of 18. This would be a rather inclusive definition that more than likely it does not correspond to how, how people would self-identify themselves. But then uh, there are other measurement issues about using gender of sex partners. What do you do for, for people who don't have sex? And there are quite a few uh, people who, uh, in terms of the survey data, when you get both self-reported identity and sexual behavior information, you find that uh, there are lots of sexual orientation minorities that would not be coded, they'd be undercounted in, if you use the strictly behavioral definition. So the, there are both misses in both directions. There's overcounting, but also undercounting of the kinds of uh, subpopulations that uh, uh, identity legislation and uh, codification of, of anti-discrimination policy are targeting. Then there's the question of which labor market outcomes do we care about. The one we observe in most of the data sets I'm going to summarize are some kind of either individual income or uh, household income. And you can get different results uh, looking at those two different ones. Uh, there's also probably more important margins of discrimination, which is in the hiring decisions and firing decisions. And these are incredibly difficult to observe directly. And I'll mention one experimental study that attempts to uh, to study that issue. In our 2002 paper at this time, it, gender and, uh, and sexual orientation discrimination is legal in most of the US. And so you'd almost be surprised not to find it. Uh, lots, of, lots of historical anecdotal evidence and indeed 22% is the number that Don and I estimated trying to use uh, some improved measures of, of income relative to Lee Badgett's study and also looking at the sensitivity to different, uh, different coding schemes for saying who in fact is a sexual orientation minority based on these general social survey questions of, of, of number and gender of sexual partners. These are the behavioral definitions. Then you get a 30% wage premium for otherwise as similarly qualified lesbians using the general social survey data. And one unfortunate uh, inter misinterpretation of this result is, is that uh, some lesbian activists have, have seen this result and, uh, and said, well, this uh, kind of clouds the picture of, uh, of discrimination and the evidential record. The existence of a premium, though, does not rule out discrimination in any, in any way, shape, or form. And the, the theory behind this is if you do have a discriminatory environment and there are costs and benefits to coming out and there's some unobserved component of, of labor market productivity and only if it were the case, for example, that only the best situated workers uh, felt like they're, they were secure enough at work to, uh, to bear the costs of coming out at work, then you could have uh, a highly non-random subset of lesbians who are out and, les and self-described lesbians at work. And you could see a 30% wage premium that, you know, if, if this is the upper 5% tail of the ability distribution uh, for then you might, uh, you might be finding that they also are discriminated against at work and should be paid more. Uh, we simply don't have enough direct, uh, directly 
observable wage and discrimination observations to really sort out those two possibilities. But the existence of a wage premium uh, certainly it's, does not mean uh, and is not interpreted by the economic statisticians who deal with this data as an absence of evidence of discrimination. Okay, and then the next issue we looked at is there's their terrible non-response in problems. Lots of people don't ask, answer the question when you ask, uh, who do you have sex with? Who, what was their gender? How do you self-describe your sexual orientation? And insofar as we do live in a homophobic environment, then there are, are different costs and benefits to answering those sorts of questions. And uh, the basic textbook calculus of cost-benefit uh, maximization would suggest that there, if you've got, if it's costly to be out, then uh, you would expect disproportionate or systematic misreporting according to sexual orientation. And this would lead to severe undercounting of, of the number of sexual orientation minorities and also would bias the, the kinds of statistical estimates trying to look for, uh, look for the wage gap. So moving from an individual wage gap to trying to aggregating, uh, aggregate an aggregate number of the economic harm associated with this discrimination, then you need another important number that I'm not convinced any of us really have, which is how many sexual orientation minorities are there in any country, including the US. So we did some work looking at uh, allowing for a systematic component where uh, sexual orientation minorities were more likely to non-respond to questions and allowing for that, uh, that statistical phenomenon we get uh, estimates, revised estimates of the number of affected Americans, uh, but seven, you know, up to seven, four percent, four percent, and seven percent. And these numbers are, you know, f probably five to fifteen million more Americans than you would get by using the most conservative uh, measures. So, I'm I'm still not convinced we've got the right number here. There has been some subsequent work that uh, that lines up with these numbers. Then the, another thing we did was we looked at uh, direct evidence of self-reported dishonesty. Uh, if you can believe data like this, and indeed, just as the cost-benefit calculus I, I mentioned where uh, homophobic environments means that there are, are different costs and benefits toward uh, accurate self-revelation and certain kinds of sensitive survey question, uh, data instruments, and then you do find uh, also self-described evidence of a, of a sexual orientation differential and the, the propensity to non-respond and to misreport. If, there's, if, there's a, if it's costly to tell the truth, then it would, be, it would be irrational to tell the truth at the same rate, is the, the simple economic calculus. Uh, but this implies that a lot of the numbers that get reported um, may have s systematic flaws. Okay, now this is going to be way too fast. This is a blast uh, to try to cover a, a, s a survey the evidence. We talked about Badgett's seminal, seminal study. As I mentioned, m all the data that gets mentioned in this literature based on U.S. Census, this is only matching cohabitation numbers and uh, most of the estimates based on the cohabitation definition of a sexual orientation minority come up with a far smaller wage gaps. And I don't really think that these numbers are to, should, be, should be believed, but they're very much prevalent in, in the economics wage discrimination of sexual orientation literature. There's survey data of public sector employees that finds evidence of evidence. There are a couple health surveys uh, that do ask, uh, ask for self-identified sexual orientation, finding evidence that gay males, once again, are uh, earning less after you control for all their productivity characteristics. Here's another current population survey. No direct, social, uh, no direct information about sexual orientation in these data. Uh, I mentioned those results. The lesbian wage differentials depending on which subregion and technique of measurement, and there have been 10% wage penalties and up to 30% wage premia. Uh, 
suffice to say, there's just been, uh, you get a lot of different numbers depending on which data you look at. Regarding uh, transgender wage differentials, the, uh, the evidence is very, very scarce. And there's some survey data about, uh, about self-reported self-reports self of discrimination, but the, the data sets to undertake a similar exercise in estimating this are, as far as I'm aware, unavailable in any of the data sets. There's been one meta-analysis. There are already more than 20 papers looking at wage gaps by sexual orientation, enough for a meta-study to be published, but once again finding the, the gay male wage penalty is, is the, the only one that holds up across all these different te you know, techniques, definitions. Okay, then he, summarizing the data sources, it's, it's a lot sparser than we would like. We would like to have, have more information. Maybe we'll get, we'll get it and be able to estimate these things more precisely. Some have looked at the effectiveness of anti-discrimination policy there's been a lot of change in the institutional environment in the last 10, 15 years. So that kind of variation lends itself to um, more statistical studies, which should be forthcoming. The initial studies by Clowater and Flat uh, found no effect and attributed this to lax enforcement. There's uh, Canadian data suggesting a, a gay male wage penalty. French, there's a French working paper finding of six, six and five percent gay male wage penalties. Germany, 10, 10 to 12 percent gay male wage penalty. Even, uh, I guess, the Netherlands would be on your list of progressive uh, yeah. rather than, and it's showing up at three percent. 3% wage penalty, and um, there's now a working paper using Swedish data linked with some surveys ma matching to register information. This also uses uh, s some assumptions, but finds there is evidence of, uh, of gay males being discriminated against in terms of, of wages. Greece, this is the one experimental study where a CVs with identical education and, and productivity characteristics were sent out, uh, fictitious ones, to many employers. And then the, the main outcome was the callback rate. The, the way that the CVs differed by sexual orientation was a, a one line about volunteering in a Greek, uh, Greek anti-discrimination or gay rights group. And this study found a significant difference in, uh, in callback rates. You know, we would like to be able to observe more about hiring decisions and uh, just as importantly, firing decisions, especially since some of the, the case law has, has been about uh, wrongful termination, in, in, including the state of Texas. And maybe Ryan will talk more about that. Uh, all we've got, for the most part, is wage differentials and this one study on callback rates. That's it. Uh, we, the, this literature has, has nothing else. The, there's uh, Australian data showing a small wage penalty f of that lesbians, that young lesbians in Australia are earning less than similarly qualified. So you, once again, the, the data picture is, is, does not crystallize around a single set of stylized facts for the lesbian workers, uh, but the gay male wage penalty seems to show up across many countries, including those that we think of as having the most progressive and explicit production, uh, protections already built into, into labor law. Uh, I want to go from this descriptive set of uh, stylized facts, as economists would call them, and think about the, the prescriptive part. As I mentioned, uh, for me, this is the prima facie evidence of you know, when you get these persistent wage gaps across many studies that can't, don't disappear no matter how many uh, controls for, for productivity you throw into the wage regressions, it, it looks like uh, that ought to motivate 
um, more labor market protections, the sexual citizenship, human rights uh, codification, though, brings, uh, brings this to mind. And I think Yasmin's uh, skepticism last night was nice to include in this discussion. And what I wanted to, to finish with were just two thoughts on, on institutionalization of uh, codification of rights and labor protections. So labor economists are, agree across the board that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, led unambiguously to improved labor market outcomes for, uh, for racial minorities. Uh, so it's hard to find a less controversial piece of non-discrimination uh, legislation. But could you imagine that this would work equally well in other times and places in Haiti or Brazil where the taxonomy of racial ethnic classification doesn't fit the US context. Uh, it's not at all clear that this kind of civil rights language is a one size fits all for all cultures and times and places. Uh, so then I just wanted to initiate a conversation with, especially with Hans's uh, prolific work on trying to get uh, a harmonization of, of rights, uh, whether this agenda, uh, what are the natural limitations to this? And uh, the final piece of this comes from some work in the policy analysis frame. So one reason you want different nation states and maybe even different localities to be experimenting with lots of different approaches uh, is so that best practices might be discovered. If you have no variation, if we harmonize and have exactly the same codification of rights in, uh, say, across all nation states, I don't know if, that's, if that were the, the, the end goal in sight, uh, then you might worry that uh, we're missing out on the discovery of, of a superior codification of those rights. I don't know, but I just put it out there that uh, when you think about a policy environment as an ecosystem that uh, the variation we get uh, across different lo local approaches and different, uh, different uh, culture, time, place specific uh, codifications or lack of codifications using informal social norms to do, I, I really don't know. But I, I wanted to put that out there as, uh, as, as one of the, the elements of the discussion moving from the stylized facts of wage gaps to thinking about what this actually motivates in the prescriptive normative realm. Uh, there is a, a literature in sociology and that some economists have tried to contribute to on the codification of re, uh, rights for religious minorities. And uh, this is also a, a similar set of concerns about uh, gains from harmonizing protections and notions of rights and uh, universal principles versus the costs of losing out on variation and maybe locking in at, uh, at a suboptimal uh, legislative norm, uh, this is the cost-benefit uh, thinking in terms of the policy experimentation that I hope will enter the conversation. All right, thanks. Morning. Um, my name is Ryan Nelson. Uh, I'm a practice attorney, practicing attorney from New York. Uh, I, I did not just wander over from the undergrad, even though I look like it a little bit. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about remedies for sexual orientation discrimination in the workplace. Uh, before I begin, I just want to give a little bit of background about me and my history. Um, I work for Jackson Lewis, uh, which our moderator mentioned. This is management side work. I only represent businesses. And usually when I'm speaking to LGBT rights activists and mention that, there's some Darth Vader music that starts playing. Um, it's OK. Um, I actually love working for management side and doing defense work. Um, I find it really helpful. And hopefully, I'll be able to explain why a little bit on my talk. Um, but 
I am, uh, we are one of the largest firms in the country and we have the distinction of representing only labor and employment cases and only management. Uh, we were recently named the number one labor and employment litigation firm in the country. And I'm one of our go-to LGBT rights guys. So there are about three or four of us who handle the difficult cases. Uh, the run-of-the-mill sexual orientation discrimination type stuff, I don't really get involved in. It's more when you get cross-border, very difficult cases, or when we get a midnight call from a company who wants to get 100% on the HRC uh, workforce review and don't have it yet and need it by 6 a.m. So that's what I do. Um, so let's talk a little bit. So the outline of what I'm talking about today, uh, what is versus what could be, the current state of the law versus what might be. Um, and I also want to focus on equal employment opportunity or EEO laws as contrasted from affirmative action laws. Uh, I am sure, speaking to you from the University of Texas at Austin, that y'all know a little bit about affirmative action laws. Um, I think they don't get a lot of play in the employment world, and I think they should. So I want to talk about them, explain what they are, and why I think they don't get the discussion that they deserve. So uh, the next slide is actually examples, so you don't have to worry too much about my kind of tiny print at the bottom. So first, let's talk examples. An EEO law, an equal employment law, is like Title VII. It's one where the law tells employers what you can't do. You can't discriminate on the basis of race, on the basis of sex, on the basis of a whole bunch of things. Um, and I gave some examples here. I think these are pretty straightforward. Um, if you're paying Bob more than Sally because Bob's white, that's gonna violate Title VII. What we don't hear a lot about are affirmative action laws. So there are three big affirmative action and employment laws in the United States. The biggest one is Executive Order 11246. Uh, and this provides affirmative action on the basis of race, gender, national origin, religion, it tracks Title VII. Um, there are also affirmative action laws for veterans and for individuals with disabilities, uh, VEVRA, and what remains of the Rehabilitation Act. Uh, it's actually only Section 503 of the Rehab Act. But what affirmative action laws do, I think is what's important here. Because in the general discourse about employment discrimination in the United States, as it relates to sexual orientation, pretty much all you hear about is ENDA. And if there's one takeaway that I would like everyone to get from my talk, it's that ENDA is not the end all be all. ENDA is not the end of the game. And there is more work that we could do. And that's where we're gonna talk a little bit about affirmative action. Um, an example that I give for affirmative action, this is a lot of what I do. Um, federal contractors must actively recruit minorities in certain segments of their workforce where the percent of minorities is less than the percent of minorities available. First of all, I think it's worth defining this term federal contractor because especially for those of you from the EU, this may be something that's not as common. The United States government is assumed to have an authority to regulate the businesses that it does business with. This is not something you're gonna find explicitly in the US Constitution, but it kind of makes sense. The federal government needs to buy pencils. We all think they can buy pencils. It's not in the Constitution, so in theory, yeah, it makes sense. However, for anyone who's here from law school, you might ask yourself, where is that? We all know generally in the Constitution that federal government is one of limited powers. And unless the Constitution affirmatively grants you a right, you don't have that right. The Tenth Amendment reserves it to the states. And there ain't nothing in the Constitution that says you can buy pencils. I know this is really kind of theoretical, but I think it illustrates an important point of view that generally we, I, we believe that the federal government can regulate these businesses, but it's not actually proven that this is something that's in the Constitution. And when we say you can regulate businesses, we mean more than just say, all right, we're gonna buy pencils from you. We're gonna say if we're gonna buy pencils from you, we're gonna attach a laundry list of things that you have to do in order to get our money. Well, one of the things that they've had to do since President Johnson's administration in the 50s is all of this affirmative action work. 
if you have a business that has 50 or more employees and has at least $50,000 worth of business with any federal agency in any given year, you are required to do a number of affirmative action analyses. One of these is what I'm referring to here. It's called a utilization analysis, where you have to break up your workforce in different segments and compare and contrast the percent of women and minorities that you have with the percent of women and minorities that are available to you. So if you've ever been in a job in America and they've asked you what your race and gender is, this is one of the reasons they might be doing that, because they're trying to figure out all the segments of their workforce, how many women and minorities they have. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we, what we currently have. Uh, it's only one slide. <laughs> There's not much. Uh, I'm only con concentrating on federal law. Uh, as we referred to earlier, uh, I think it was Nathan who mentioned, the, there are state laws and local laws that protect against employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Right now it's 21 states and the District of Columbia plus a slew of localities. Um, we heard some talk from Daniel yesterday that Texas is trying to get a Texas end up. That would be great if it actually happens. What you're seeing on this slide is just federal laws. Uh, for private employers, th there are no laws when it comes to sexual orientation. Um, and there also are no affirmative action laws when it comes to sexual orientation. Uh, for state and local governments, you can try an equal protection clause claim. Um, I think, personally, I think it's going to be stronger now that we're in a post-Windsor world and that we have some of that language that you might be able to apply in the employment discrimination context. Uh, again, no affirmative action laws. For the federal government, uh, we actually, it is prohibited. Sexual orientation discrimination in the federal civilian workforce is prohibited by an executive order. Uh, and for any employer in the federal government, you're subject to the Fifth Amendment's equal protection component. This is actually what Windsor rested on. Uh, we're used to talking about the equal protection clause, which is only in the 14th Amendment, and it only applies to state and local governments. Windsor was a federal case. For 14th Amendment doesn't apply to the federal government. We're only talking Fifth Amendment world here. And the Fifth Amendment incorporates by reference all of the substantive components of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So really, when you see 14 and 5, you can treat them one and the same. Substantively, since the case of Bowling versus Sharp, these are really treated the same. Now we're getting into the bulk of my talk. What could be? ENDA. The Employment Non-Discrimination Act would prohibit private employers from discriminating on several bases, including sexual orientation. It's been proposed forever. Um, it's been passed in the Senate. I'm not going to hold my breath that it's going to pass in the House. You're free to. Um, I don't really, I'm not holding out hope for it. Um, I've included at the bottom here Macy versus Holder. This is not sexual orientation, but I, I feel like it's the elephant in the room in employment discrimination law for LGBT, and I feel like it would be a disservice not to mention it. Uh, so this is an April 2012 EEOC opinion. Uh, in the United States, in employment discrimination in federal law, you do not have the right to sue immediately. You cannot sue your employer for discrimination immediately. You must exhaust administrative remedies. In other words, you got to go to the EEOC first and claim, hey, I think I was discriminated against. Well, the EEOC very rarely publishes the results of its opinion, but it did so in 2012 for this rather monumental case of Mia Macy. Uh, Mia Macy uh, was applying for a position at the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosions, the ATFE, and she called up her director, and the director said, yeah, we're going to have a position for you. Don't worry about it. You just got to pass a background check. Well, before all of that was completed, she called them up and said, by the way, I'm transitioning. Uh, I'm transitioning to become a woman. And they said, oh, uh, sorry, suddenly the job's not available anymore. Well, the EEOC published an opinion based on those set of facts and decided that, and quote, gender identity, change of sex, and transgender status are unlawful under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Just kind of a note for anyone interested, it does not say gender expression. It says gender identity, change of sex, and transgender status. And that's kind of interesting. Um, this is also interesting because Title VI only prohibits sex discrimination. So really, the EEOC has decided that these three different things are shoehorned within sex discrimination. 
Uh, I can tell you in practice, because I do this all the time, there's nothing on the forms. When you go to the EEOC, it's just a checkbox. I was discriminated, race, check here. It just says sex. So to the extent that these are available, yeah, they're available if you're affluent and you know that they're available to you, or maybe if you're talking to an investigator who's affluent enough. But if you're just filling out a checkbox, these are not available. It just says sex. Um, there's yet to be any challenges to Macy. I think they're forthcoming. Um, I think a smart employer, if they're really faced with a challenge that they don't want to settle, could potentially challenge Macy um, as being beyond the scope of Title VII. Um, you know, agencies do not have carte blanche to interpret statutes and regulations as they see fit. They are afforded a great deal of deference, and we defer generally to an agency interpretation of their statutes. So the EEOC's interpretation that sex includes all of these things would certainly be given deference. But the question is going to be, is that deference reasonable? Um, I think this is going to be a forthcoming case. I think for any law students in the room looking to write a note, I think that would be a really interesting note. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about end of the, kind of the lesser known aspects, because I always think these are interesting, um, and especially contrasted with Polish law, where I was fever, feverishly taking notes on what Polish law allows. Uh, this all comes from the end of that passed the Senate a few weeks ago. So this is currently what's being proposed. It does not allow for disparate impact claims under ENDA. Uh, in employment discrimination world in the United States, there's disparate treatment and there's disparate impact. And the best way to think of this is how you're alleging the lawsuit. So a disparate treatment is this company rejected someone because of their race. I reject Bob because he is black. Contrast that to disparate impact. Disparate impact, you are rejecting someone in the case of a failure to hire on a neutral ground, a ground that has no race in it, such as a credit check. And this is a, I mentioned credit checks because the EEOC is all over this, and they have been since 06, where this is really what they're looking at. They're saying, look, you're rejecting people on a disparate, on a neutral ground, but it's causing an impact to a statistically significant degree on the basis of race. Well, that's not allowed for sexual orientation claims if the current version of ENDA passes. Uh, I was actually planning on this talk to say, I can't for the life of me think of a disparate impact on the basis of sexual orientation. I'm really, had the, really happy that Christoph went first, because he thought of some. Um, I, I think that's a brilliant example, the example from Poland, that if you say you need to be in a stable married relationship, if we pass ENDA and a state, in any state where sexual orientation is not protected under state or local law, if you have an employer who just says, you need to be in a stable married relationship, and assuming marital status is not a protection, which it isn't in most states, I think that's legal. And that's frightening. Because I think that is going, I don't think that's getting a lot of play. Um, so I would be very interested, actually, to, I, I might take that up and write something on that, because I, I think that's remarkable. Um, I've heard, I don't know about y'all, I've heard nothing about that discussed in the papers. So. Um, the next kind of lesser known aspect of INDA, these definitions that I personally, this is a pet peeve of mine, um, they're defining sexual orientation as the big three, as homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual. Yeah, well, we're leaving out sexual minorities. Um, I mean, homosexual is a sexual minority enough, but especially in our community where our, we are sexual minorities trying to advocate for these, we should be aware of the minorities within the minority community, including asexuality, those who identify as just queer, those who identify as pansexual or omnisexual. Um, I believe that asexuality will be covered. There is strong precedent under Title VII that atheism is protected the same way theism is. So I would believe that a court would interpret asexuality the same as sexuality, but it's not clear. And I could see a strong argument that they left it out, therefore it's not protected. So I would be weary of leaving that out. Don't, don't leave things out. There are people like me defending these things. I will fight these things in weird ways. I wouldn't leave, leave, I wouldn't leave that out. Um, we mentioned a little bit in Poland, they have association claims. This is brand new in the United States. There is no such thing as an explicit association claim in our employment laws on the federal level. But ENDA has one. 
ENDA prohibits discrimination, and I'll quote it, taken against an individual based on the actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity of a person with whom the individual associates or has associated. That doesn't exist in Title VII, that doesn't exist in the ADA, in VEVRA, in anything at all. That's brand new. And I'm trying to bring a little bit of an employer's perspective, because these are the questions I would ask. Are there any temporal boundaries on this? If you associated pe with gay people when you're a teenager and the employer finds out about it 70 years later, does that count? Are you still protected? What if you associated with gay people before ENDA was passed? Is it retroactive? Um, I would ask how deep of an association. Um, I know from an employer's perspective, I get a lot of what's called kitchen sink discrimination claims where the person files a lawsuit for being fired and they just check all the boxes and they say they were discriminated for everything. Well, I happen to think association claims is a good thing to include in ENDA, but from an employer's perspective, it's a terrible thing because they're going to be all over this. Every lawsuit that anyone files from now on is going to say, oh, and they knew I talked to a gay person once, association claim. I guarantee this is going to happen, and I do think association claims are merit. They're, they have merit, but I, I wish that the either the statute or at least the regulations would go a little bit further and give us some guidance as what they mean when they say associate. Um, and then uh, one th just kind of interesting thing to note. So perceived sexual orientation, perceived gender identity, that's in there. Perceived association isn't. I think that's kind of interesting. So if you think someone is, is hanging around with gay people, you can discriminate against them. But if you know that they're hanging around with gay people, you can't. That's my reading of this statute. And again, I think this is really poor draftsmanship. I, I think these are some holes. Uh, the religi religious exemptions, I'm just going to make fun of for a bit because I can. Um, I think these are ridiculous. Um, the religious exemptions exempt any organization who is re exempted from religious discrimination um, under Title VII. I'm not aware of any religion that makes it sinful to hire a gay person. Um, if you can come up with one, sure, I think that's a perfectly legitimate ground, but um, I, I am quite facetious. I, 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 I hate these exemptions. I think they're absolutely ridiculous, um, and it's rare that I get to bring that normative component to this. Um, the last quick things that I'll just make fun of with ENDA, they have a dress and grooming standards component. No idea why. Um, and they have a no additional facilities component. I, these, I, I put these in because I think this is ridiculous. Uh, this building isn't gay enough. I'm suing. I, I can't imagine why these are in there, but they're in there. And still, and is apparently not powerful enough. Let's talk about what could be with affirmative action. The ENDA executive order is an order that has been proposed, and the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, has approved it. President Obama could sign it today, and he has not, and I don't know why. Um, it could affect up to 30 million Americans. Any business that does business with the federal government would be affected. It would prohibit these federal contractors, these people contracting with the federal government, from discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, when the press secretary has been posed with these questions of why haven't you signed the end of executive order, the response has always been, we are fighting for an inclusive ENDA. And I want you all to know that is not responsive and that is ridiculous. You can fight for an inclusive ENDA, but this does more. Numbers two through five up here are things that ENDA cannot do, but the ENDA executive order can do. And if there is one takeaway that I want you to glean from this talk, it's that the ENDA executive order not only needs more focus, but it can do things that ENDA can't. And the discussion in the public sphere has forgotten that. So yes, ENDA can do number one, no discrimination for roughly 10% of Americans. But it can also require affirmative policies. The ENDA executive order could require these federal contractors to have all benefits available to marriage couples be available to domestic partners. It could require equal leave times for spouses in same-sex marriages. A quick note, uh, this is a common misunderstanding of Windsor. Windsor does not actually provide equal FMLA time, even though FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act, is federal law. Under FMLA, it defers to the state of residence 
of the employee seeking time. So if you legally got married in California and you work in California, but you live across the border in Nevada, you can't take FMLA time to care for your sick same-sex spouse. Your employer can legally deny you time, even if you are legally married, from going out on that. And actually, the employer probably should, because you don't want a potential double dipping situation where the employee gets 12 weeks of what they think are FMLA time and maybe move into California where now they do get FMLA benefits and can take 12 weeks uninhibited. So the FMLA regulations need to be fixed. This is one thing that we could do with the end of executive order. Could prohibit employers from enrolling in health plans that don't offer transgender inclusive insurance benefits. Which, by the way, we now are in a world where the majority of private insurance plans in America do not offer transgender inclusive insurance benefits. Uh, we could require employers to permit transgender employees access to the restrooms corresponding to their gender identity. This is an open issue even after Macy. It's not clear that transgender discrimination allows you to enter the, gen the restroom according to your gender identity. The end of executive order could do that. Could require gender neutral dress codes. It requ could require a transitioning policy. It could require training. Could do a lot. The last things that I'll end on are kind of the pie in the sky things that the order could do that I don't think it should do yet, but we could see in 10 to 20 years. Uh, this is what the future of employment discrimination for sexual orientation might be. And we talked a little bit about this uh, with uh, Nathan and Don's research of comp analyses. It would require you to solicit the LGBT stat or the LGB status at least of your workforce um, to be able to analyze comp. And you could identify comp inequities and potentially identify the managers who are causing those comp problems and discipline them. But it exposes employers to a lot of liability. If you require this end of executive order, it's across the country, including Texas. Well, Texas doesn't protect you from employment discrimination. Could you imagine a world where you're required to ask your employees if they're gay or not, but you live in a state where it's okay to fire them? And although the end of executive order could protect against such discrimination, it's a contract. It's a contract with the federal government. It's not a law that you're violating, it's a contract. So the worst case scenario is you lose your contract. Well, that's not a lot of protection for these employees. Um, uh, additionally, kind of a, a common idea, it may out employees who don't want to be outed, and I don't think we're there yet, in, in American culture at least. I did a recent talk on this with um, a British counterpart, where they are starting to see this more often as a voluntary measure in the UK, and uh, he's at a very large corporation. They do ask their employees for sexual orientation, and it's kind of accepted. Uh, these are in increasing levels of pie in the skyness of things that are probably not going to happen. The utilization analysis compares segments of your workforce to the demographics of what you have available. And Nathan and Don's research shows you, we don't have data available. We don't know how many gay people are in this country. Um, and the quick statistics on it that I just wanted to mention, Nathan mentioned the census data only asks cohabitational information. And they correlate cohabitation with sexual orientation wrongly. Uh, in a recent California study, 37 to 46% of gay men and 51 to 62% of lesbians were in cohabitational relationships. Contrast that to 62% of heterosexuals in a cohabitational relationship. Correlating the two doesn't make sense. You're comparing apples and oranges. But that's what this could do. Um, my time's up. I'm just going to briefly talk about this last thing, this adverse impact analysis. This could compare and contrast your hiring rates, your promotion rates, and your termination rates. The reason this is really pie in the sky is now you're not only asking your employees if they're gay, you're asking your applicants. That's really out there. But it could happen. And these are things that could be proposed tomorrow and could come into law. Um, so I'll end with this takeaway. The end of executive order is not a subset of ENDA. If it does what I would propose in this paper that I have, that I have a lot of copies of and y'all should grab, because if not, they're going to be in my apartment forever. Um, if the end of executive order is implemented in the way it should be, 10% of Americans could live in workforces and work in these workforces where these amazing workplace policies could go into effect. And we could have that tomorrow without Congress. And that's a really important thing nowadays. So thank you all so much. I appreciate it.
So thank you all for very engaging, clear, and um, concise presentations. So they were all to the minute, almost, and yet we're out of time. So Tom, do you want to, should we have five minutes of questions? Uh, I don't want to throw off the whole day. Uh, sure. I mean, uh, you know, we, we can move into much we can. if we need to. OK. Plus, I think we'll have a little extra time in the next panel. OK. So why don't we, um, I think maybe what I would propose is we just get a few questions from the audience and then let everybody have a word, maybe responding to those questions or to each other because you also did a very nice job of referencing each other's talks. The, mi the microphones. Three days. I just want to say y'all are great. <laughs> the microphone's <laughs> coming up. I've been doing this kind of work for over three decades, and you guys are great. Thank, Thank you, you each for all of your hard work. And I want a copy of your paper. <laughs> You'll have to make do with the actual recommendation because I didn't have a paper. I only have scribbled little notes. <laughs> Sorry about that. In regard to workforce, um, correlation between or negative impact or, or positive impact for lesbians and gays and their um, salary. Do you see this in specific job categories? That the question is whether uh, workers are sorting into certain industries, professions, job types uh, by sexual orientation. So the, that it was first on, in the statistical, analysis of the people who looked at these data trying to control for job type and uh, there are some estimates that suggest that uh, if you look at just the, you can take a wage gap and then decompose it into uh, a difference in characteristics which are volitional, like choosing to go into a highly paid profession that requires lots of higher education, for example, and then the rest which would, would be a differential return on those productivity characteristics. And most of the, f the findings say that the, the sorting argument cannot make the gaps go away. And uh, so no, I, do, I think the evidence is, is not airtight, but nothing points to a labor market sorting explanation for the, the lesbian wage premium that is reported only in some of the studies that we mentioned. Hi, thank you for your papers. I have a question about affirmative action as it relates to sexual orientation. Granted, the larger political context, including the context obviously here in Texas and here at the University of Texas at Austin, um, what are the sort of larger political implications of pursuing an affirmative action policy to address sexual orientation discrimination in this climate? Uh, the question is what are the political ramifications of pursuing affirmative action? Um, I, I think that's the reason we haven't seen them yet. Because affirmative action has a negative connotation, or I won't even say negative, I'll say political connotation. Um, one thing that's important to take away is that affirmative action in employment is vastly different from the types of affirmative action that you hear about on the news. Um, the reason, by the way, for many of our U EU colleagues that we keep talking about UT Austin, the largest case of affirmative action in the past decade just happened here, uh, Fisher versus the University of Texas at Austin. And that's because at present, it is still legal under constitutional law to consider race as one of many holistic factors in an admission decision to a university, providing that you do so under several strictures. Contrast that with employment law. Affirmative action in employment does not permit you to hire, promote, or advance anyone in employment on the basis of sexual orientation, or race, or gender. You can't hire someone because they're black. You can't hire someone because they're a woman, and affirmative action doesn't change that. What affirmative action makes you do is recruit. So you have a group, uh, a segment of your workforce that doesn't have enough women. Well, you have to go out and apply and get a whole bunch of people to apply who are women. Maybe you contact the National Organization for Women or a women's group, and you flood your applicant pool. And the idea is that you set a goal for yourself that is aspirational, not mandatory. You try to get more women 
without actually taking gender into account in your hiring decisions. And if that seems crazy, it's because it is in practice and many HR managers' heads explode when I explain that to them. But if we do that for affirmative action for LGBT status, you have to ask yourself, well, where would we do our outreach? Um, I don't know if there is a strong infrastructure for all segments of the workforce to provide qualified LGBT candidates that we could even supplement underutilized workforces with. Hans, I, I'd be curious, um, has there been any attention in Europe on um, criminal sentencing and discrimination in sentencing? Uh, we've seen here in the United States, the organization that I work with, that um, particularly gay youth, but uh, homosexual cases in sex offender law sentencing um, are disproportionately punished for the crimes compared to heterosexual um, offenses. Well, actually, I think probably Helmut knows how to answer that question better than I do, because he's been working more on, 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 on that sort of issue. Um, I, my answer is I, I really don't know. Um, could, why, why don't we could I have the chance to respond to two yeah, things Yeah, I was going to say, okay. why don't we take one more question okay. and then have a round to for you each to have a response. To, yes, OK. I understand that the purpose of this gathering is sexual citizenship, but I have, and you talk about uh, equal opportunity and affirmative action and, and all these things, I've never heard one word about sec, uh, discrimination because of age. I'm 85 years old. Uh, I haven't heard one word talk about discrimination on age, which is very difficult to prove. N anybody want to comment on that? Okay, so why don't we just start and okay. have you in the same order respond Thanks. to whatever you like. <laughs> okay, I'll start with the age issue. Um, I've, I haven't been touching on it because our, the, the recommendation I've been talking on is about sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, uh, in general, I mean, age is a prohibited ground for discrimination under European Union uh, employment law. Um, though you're right, it's a difficult area because it, it, it's, a, it's also a ground which where there's a you know a large number of exceptions because people seem to agree on a number of, 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 of situations where it it can be considered as legitimate to, to, to take age into consideration. But it is a prohibited ground for discrimination under European Union um, discrimination law. Uh, just one comment uh, uh, in response to Nathan's question about you know the harmonization of codes and codifications. Um, I mean I only highlighted a few things of the of the recommendation. Um, we, I took, we took particularly care not to focus on only on, that, on legislation and codification. So that is why we repeatedly talk about um, recommending the governments of the member states of the Council of Europe to, to take legislative and or other measures because there are a number of, of, of other measures that are sometimes much more adequate than, than, than legislating. I mean, we spend a lot of text on issues of, of training, for instance, follow-up, monitoring, um, that sort of thing. So it's not all about harmonization, about laws. I think the goals uh, are certainly universal. I mean, the right to be able to go through school and get an education without being you know, physically and, 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 and psychologically abused, I mean, that applies to all children in all countries uh, all around the world. Uh, but the way how to get there might certainly differ a lot, and we, we take that into account. The other comment would be um, that I would like to make is in, in response to Ryan's discussion about the disparate impact uh, and the example that, that Christoph gave us on, 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 uh, on marriage requirement. Um, that is the, the, the example that is always given when it comes to sexual orientation, because, precisely because it is difficult to find other examples. But I would, I usually argue that, at least in my book, uh, requiring someone to live in a stable marriage, at least a married relationship, is not a question of disparate impact, a question of indirect discrimination. It's actually a question of direct uh, impact, discriminatory impact, uh, or uh, disparate treatment, or direct discrimination. Because the disparate impact of the indirect discrimination uh, definition includes um, effects that 
um, disproportionately affects a certain group, or where, you, where a certain group of people have uh, considerably lesser chances of fulfilling a requirement uh, or, or complying with a requirement uh, than, than others. Now, when it comes to the marriage requirement, it's not that you know, considerably larger amount of gay and lesbian people will have difficulties in fulfilling it or, or being negatively impacted by this requirement. All of them would, 100%, because they are legally excluded from the possibility of fulfilling that requirement. Now that, in my book, is, amounts to direct discrimination or uh, disparate treatment. And I would go back to the, under European Union law, for instance, um, discrimination on grounds of pregnancy is considered as direct discrimination, gender, gender discrimination, because only women can be pregnant. pregnant. So it's not uh, an effect that is dis disproportionate in that it affects statistically a larger portion, but it can, own, can only affect that category, and therefore it's considered direct impact. I have no idea whether under US law that would ever be interpreted in the same way, but you know, that, is, that is what I would like to, to comment on that. Thank you. Um, I don't think it would for what it's worth. There is a complicated US law yeah, answer yeah. to that, but we probably won't go into it all, because Tom's standing up. So one minute each, Christoph and, yeah? Nathan? Thanks to Hans for, for that explanation. And I found all the language to be very much reasonable. And uh, I appreciate that there are non-legislative initiatives to complement the codification of laws. Um, I'll do two quick points. Uh, to the age point, uh, the EEOC protects eight different protected classifications. Seven of those have affirmative action counterparts. Age is the only one that doesn't. Um, age is the only protected classification that the EOC protects that is not covered by an affirmative action counterpart. Um, age is also one of the only classifications that received semi-protected status under federal law. It only counts if you're over 40 under federal law. Then you can qualify for age discrimination. State laws are different. So interesting theories on age. Uh, and the only comment that I'll make substantively is uh, one that Christoph made that I thought was fascinating. In Poland, under the direct discrimination, I wrote down that you can prove that you were treated differently or would be treated differently in a comparable situation. That's very different from US law. US law, you had to prove that there is a similarly situated employee, not a similarly situ situated fictional employee that you could make up. And I think that's fascinating. So one thing I'll be talking to him about after, and y'all can join if you want, it's how you actually prove that under Polish law, because I think we could learn something in U.S. law. All right. Um, before you join in thanking me, we'll tell you what time to be back, What? because uh, it's going to be a long applause. 11.25? Uh, let's say 11.30. Okay. We'll have a 15-minute break for coffee, and then we'll re-adjourn at 11.30. And since one of the speakers in the next panel is not here, but... Okay sent us a short version okay. of this paper. I think we can make up. To okay. That. So <laughs> join me then in thanking this panel. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.